I am going to pass over to Ian to get the meeting started. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Libby. Um, what does the Western Gateway mean for the Forest of Dean? That's our proposition for today. And uh, we've got an absolutely stellar panel. We're going to debate that. First of all, we have Catherine Bennett, CBE. Uh, she's chair of uh, Western Gateway. And Catherine is joining us from uh, Airbus in Broughton in North Wales. Catherine is still um, senior vice president of Airbus, of course. Uh, we then got Tim Gwilliam, leader of the Forest of Dean District Council and a Liverpool supporter, so he's a happy man today. Uh, Neil Ricketts, Chair of the Forest Economic Partnership, FEP in short, and Chief Executive of Vasaria, uh, and a fellow board member of G First LEP. Andrew Callard, Managing Director of Rural Technologies and Chair of an FEP subgroup with special interest in transport. And last but not least, Mark Owen, owner editor of Punchline, uh, very, very good news uh, site for the Gloucestershire. Uh, first of all, I just want to mention uh, as a little introduction that uh, I, I believe that for far, far too long, the forest has been ignored. Uh, it sits uh, a lot of the time on the edge of Wales. And in the words of uh, Tim William, and I quote him when he told me, um, yeah, uh, the forest is the gateway between two nations and a number of counties. I think it should be at the very epicenter of the Western Gateway. For too long, uh, we've seen the forest ignored, I think. Uh, and I think the time is right uh, for us to start promoting it and shouting about it. It's a great, great place to live, fantastic communities uh, and some brilliant, brilliant businesses there. So without further ado, what I want to do is introduce Catherine Bennett to you. Uh, Catherine, as I say, is chair of Western Gateway. Uh, it's a job she's been doing, I think, since uh, my memory serves me right, really about 2000, November 2019. She's still senior vice president of Airbus. Uh, doesn't lead to June. And then she takes up uh, the CEO's job at the UK's high value manufacturing catapult. This is a very, very tough job. Uh, and she's mining a lot of things at the moment. So, Catherine, I leave it to you. What does the Western Gateway mean for the forest? Well, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, lovely to, to join this panel. Um, it's great. You're the first area, really, that's asked me to come and do a presentation like this. So uh, it's an honour to be with you today. Um, and Tim uh, reached out to me very early on after my appointment. As you said, Ian, I was appointed in November 2019, and uh, I knew that uh, he was keen to get engaged, and I saw that as a really so I've got a few slides for you just to, to give you a bit of context about the Western Gateway, because you're probably wondering, some of you are wondering what it's all about. So um, Libby's very kindly agreed to do the slides for me so we could move to the, the first slide, please, Libby, the next slide. So this slide just shows you a little bit of the context. You'll see at the bottom there three different documents. Um, and that demonstrates the history of how we got to where we are today. There's still a long journey to go on as well. And the always good to have a, a map there to show you the footprint of the Western Gateway, the ge geographical footprint. We are the first powerhouse that actually incorporates cross-border uh, working. So quite a lot of challenges, but also some opportunities. And those three documents demonstrates how we got to where we are, as I said. So the one on the left um, was a document produced about five years ago when the big cities of Bristol, Newport, Bath and Swansea got together and thought, actually, we are in a very important economic area. We have people who live and work on both sides of the bridge. Um, surely there's more we can do together. That then developed into a document put together by Lord Kerslake's um, organization, met with Metrodynamics. 
And that led to the establishment in November 2019 of the newest powerhouse, which was called the Western Gateway. And it was announced by the government um, at uh, Celtic Manor, uh, and I was asked to become the chair. Uh, as you can see, Robert Jenrick, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, very involved in the establishment, and I've had a lot of dialogue with him since, and um, you know, a lot of support. Next slide, please, Libby. So the next one, um, I'm sure you're all used to these infographics, but here we are in terms of what, what is the footprint, what is the geographical um, impact? So we estimate, as you can see, nearly 160,000 businesses based in the area. Uh, we have eight cities, of course, that includes um, Gloucester and Cheltenham, as well as, as I said, Swansea and Newport um, and some of the other um, towns and regions, including three city regions. It's a mixture of urban and, of course, rural um, and pretty insignificant economy in terms of contributions to the UK's economy. One of the things I really think stands out for us is the amazing universities that we have, 11 universities, um, you know, world leading universities, and that is surely something to build on. Transport links. Um, I know this is a big topic in the forest, but you know, there, are, there is significant infrastructure and I know we need to improve on that. There's two airports, of course, Cardiff and Bristol, and then there's the nine commercial ports, which may be not surprising considering we are based around an estuary. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we all about? Um, so as Ian said, I'm currently Senior Vice President at Airbus. This isn't my day job chairing this organisation. It is something I was asked to do by the government and the leadership um, of the local authorities. So I'm an independent business chair. Um, and why am I doing it? Well, I'm doing it because I realise that business working together with local authorities can really make a difference. And this is the whole focus, of course, when LEPs were first set up on the English side of the bridge um, in terms of getting businesses round a table with local authorities. And in a way, the Western Gateway is a bigger version of that. So we're very, very focused on business engagement, but it's the leadership of the, the political elected representatives that also contribute to making a, such a difference. So you can see here on the slide the three areas of our focus. I mentioned transport earlier, so the first one is all about connectivity. Second one is global gateway. This is our how we look to the rest of the world, encouraging investment and in, inward um, business opportunities. And thirdly, which is really key, key for Gloucestershire, is innovation. So endeavouring to work with those universities and the research councils who are in our area to help the economy. Next slide, please, Libby. So what did we do last year? Well, obviously not particularly easy time for a new powerhouse dealing with COVID. Um, so we had lots of virtual meetings, which I have to say, good engagement. So we've got the partnership board set up. I'm very proud that we've got two vice chancellors joined our board. Um, I've endeavoured to provide a strategic voice. I sort of see myself very much as the advocate for the area. Um, I've worked closely with Ian. He's done an amazing amount of support. Thank you, Ian, on helping us with the communication about the Western Gateway. So communicating and engaging with stakeholders, of course, is a much used phrase. We've had to do it all virtually. And this opportunity this morning is one of those. We also did a governance review. We commissioned Deloitte to do that, to say, what is it? How should we be constituted? How many people should we have on our board? Uh, and I'm very pleased that very recently, um, with Tim's help, actually, um, Rowena from the leader of Cheltenham Council was appointed on behalf of the Gloucestershire District to join our board. We have now appointed a small secretariat team who are 100% focused on the Western Gateway. And we've done the first phase of the independent economic review, which was done by Oxford Economics and Hardesty Jones from Cardiff University. Not wanting to forget our all important parliamentarians, we've set up an all party group for the Western Gateway, which is actually chaired by Mark Harper, uh, together um, with, um, I've forgotten her name, apologies, uh, the MP from, from Newport. And also I've appointed um, deputy chairs, which is Councillor Jane Mudd from Newport Council and Councillor Toby Savage. So they're very much helping me with running the board. 
Next slide, please. What are we getting on with this year? Well, I've talked about the global gateway, and of course, I'm sure you'll all agree how UK is looking to the rest of the world is really important. There's a lot of activity going on with respect to trade, and I'm, we're working closely with DIT on that. We're now working on the next independent economic review because you absolutely need data and facts to make good policy. And then actually we're getting on with quite a lot of support on a number of bids. One in particular nuclear fusion bid for the Oldbury and Barclay sites. We did give a little bit of support to the bid from Bristol to become a free port. Sadly, that didn't work out, but it's important and interesting to see what opportunities are coming up that can have such a big pan-regional engagement. Of course, working on engagement and communications, as we talked about. And then the latest thing we've just done is appointed three business representatives on our board. We did an application process for that, and we've got Ian Edwards, the MD of Celtic Managers, joined our board. We've got Lucy Daly, who is the um, regional director for South East Wales for the National Trust. And we've got Ben Pritchard, who is a transport expert from Arup. So that's really important to have those three business representatives. So that's where we've got to so far. We're not a huge gargantuan new local authority. I don't get paid. I'm doing this because I see it is really important for business. So um, our overheads are pretty low. We do have some funding for the government to help us with running the secretariat, but we're very, very dependent on the partners around our table. But the really key thing and why I care about this is to encourage people to work together, whether you've got small projects or larger projects, and bring the weight of all this region um, together to help with campaigns. So I'm really interested to hear today about the priorities of the Forest of Dean. I've been reading up on the key issues that you've been focusing on. And is there anything I can do to help bring the wider input of the geography is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, Catherine. There's uh, some food for thought there. And um, I just want to introduce now Tim William. Tim is leader of the Forest of Dean District Council. And he was telling me the other day, and I don't know if this is right, that uh, he's a bit of a poet. And in fact, you became known as the Bard of the Forest. Is that right, Tim? It is. It's a, it's a competition um, held once every year um, by Dean Forest Voice. I think I was I think I was the third or fourth person to win it, and it was I hasten to add it was before any sort of political career started. So perhaps you can do a poem about Western Gateway at some stage. Perhaps I, by the I've time already made I've, I've already made one or two up. They might not be for for saying first thing in the morning. To be fair, it's honestly. all right. We finish at half eleven. You should be able to do it by then. Okay. Uh, okay. Tim Tim is a great advocate for the forest. He's the son of a free miner. Uh, I've known him for some years, he's passionate, and he actually follows a lot of people in the forest, real, real passion for this area. So Tim, you've heard what Catherine has said, tell us what you want from the Western Gateway for the forest. Okay, thank you, and good morning to everyone, and it's great that so many people have joined in, and it's it's a real honour for me to be on, on this panel, because I'm alongside people that know a lot about business and for me that's great for the forest because it's the it's it's really the first time that it's had that big regional look at the forest of dean now we did something when we took over the administration and we set up the forest economic partnership which uh, neil neil now chairs and andrew did before him and that's really now starting to pay dividends for the forest but what i wanted to say is i i, I wrote Last night, I had to go at writing what I was going to say this morning in this particular bit. I wrote it three times. And every time I read it back, there was negativity there. Because it is easy for us to look back and complain that we haven't had our share, that we haven't, we haven't received the funding that we should have done. Why does it always go somewhere else? But that isn't going to do us any good then. Moaning and a groaning won't do us any good. And what we are faced with... And I, I'm saying this a lot lately because we've got the Leveling Up Fund and we've got the Western Gateway. And I've written down here a generational opportunity. And I genuinely believe that's what we have here with the Western Gateway. Um, I did say that the Forest of Dean is the epicenter of it. 
And I actually defy anyone to look at a map of the Western Gateway and say it shouldn't be. So what I would like to do without, um, without going into too much detail, because that's what officers do for us politicians. You know, we don't come up with the great slides and we don't come up with the great reports without officers sat by us. But I'd just like you to imagine if, if you can take take into a, you know take into account you know businesses in Japan, businesses in parts of Europe that might be looking to relocate me. And those businesses give their workforce. They may not be huge businesses; they're high tech businesses, but they give their workforce a lifestyle that that workforce enjoys living while they're working for that company. I believe the Forest of Dean can offer that lifestyle and that opportunity to businesses. I genuinely believe that it could be an epicenter for the Western Gateway because it could be the epicenter for high tech industries. Now, the one moan I'm going to have, and, and, and it will be a moan, is because I think in Gloucestershire, and this is where I, and this is where I'm desperate for us not to go as the Western Gateway. I don't want us to go down the route of, dare I say, the old regional development agencies. And that is sometimes the higher the climb, the better the view. And sometimes we have to do the hard stuff to get the best out of it. And while I'm asking you to test your imagination, just imagine the Forest of Dean with proper transport facilities, with a rail structure, with proper communication facilities. We all know what a wonderful place it is to live. We all know what a wonderful place it is to visit, but with the right connectivity, and the connectivity we're talking, what are we talking? We're talking about sorting some out down on the Chepstow area and sorting some out by Huntley towards Gloucester and Cheltenham. It's a fraction of the cost of when we're talking of the missing link, of continually talking about the M5, M4 corridor, continually talking about Cyber Central. For a fraction of that cost, we could truly create a proper epicenter for the Western Gateway here in the Forest of Dean. And I urge all of you to, to, to really look beyond where we've been before. For too long, we've been a Jack Russell barking away at the kitchen table looking for scraps. And some of that was our fault because we simply weren't big enough, strong enough to put in for the bids for the, um, the, the funding that we need. We've taken steps that, for that. We've now joined with other councils to, to make sure that our, our promotion through Publica, our ability to put in bids for things is now much, much stronger, much, much stronger, aligned with the work of the Forest Economic Partnership. And it's like with the uh, the levelling up fund bid. We may not get it, but I'll, I'll promise each and every one of you now, it will be a terrific bid that we put in. It will be a quality and, and professional bid we put in. And that's perhaps where we failed before. And that's no fault of any staff at the District Council. It's just that we were too small. We were almost a, a, a one and two man band trying to operate in the world of high commerce and high business. But with people like you behind us, and with the right thought process, I honestly believe, Ian, that the Forest of Dean, it, it doesn't have to change, it doesn't have to lose its magic, but it can truly become the epicenter of the Western Gateway. That's great, a great exposition with the sort of passion that you show and uh, get writing that poem. We'll ask you to recite it at the end, but uh, thank you, thank you very, very much, Tim. Um, our next member of the panel is Neil Ricketts. Uh, like me, he's uh, a member of the LEP board and he's chair of the Forest Ed Economic Partnership or FEP as it's called and chief executive Vasarian, one of our most innovative companies uh, in Gloucestershire, uh, a great standard bearer for graphene, a great standard bearer for the forest as well. Okay, Neil, your thoughts. Well, you know, I've been championing for a long time that uh, the forest is, operates within a much bigger environment than what we've tended to uh, to think about in the past. You know, it's always been Lydney versus Cinderford or Cinderford versus Colford. But that's actually not the big problem. The big problem is about, you know, the forest dean being included in a much bigger agenda. And that's why I joined the board of uh, G-First eight years ago. And, you know, I've been fighting to get the forest its... Uh, it's fair share. I've got to be honest, Tim, 
uh, on or off the field. No one's ever called me a Jack Russell, but uh, I'll put that to one side. But uh, I do think we need that fight. I do think that um, all too often we cut our nose off to spite our face. Uh, and in this particular case, We've got a great opportunity to, to, to join in with South Wales uh, and to really power ahead the whole community, not just Gloucestershire, not just the Forest of Dean, but the whole region. And when you're competing, as everyone does, whether it be rugby, football, netball or, or water polo, uh, it's about being part of a great team. And we are competing against the Northern Powerhouse, the Midlands Engine and so on. And if we're not careful, we're going to miss out again. And so what I would say to everybody is our problems are much easier to fix if we're part of a much bigger organization. And that's why I'm willing, uh, Catherine asked me this morning to be, uh, to consider being an ambassador and, and I'd love to be, uh, I might not get in. Okay. But I'll, I might not pass the entrance exam, but um, I'll give it the best shot because I, I think what we've got in the Forest of Dean is really, really special. Um, and, um, and I don't think we need to lose our identity. As you said, Tim, I think we've got our own identity. I think we're strong enough. I think we just need, uh, you know, to, to expand our thoughts. The biggest problem I find when I, when I talk in the Forest of Dean is sometimes we don't really know how special an area we've got uh, and we don't celebrate it, okay? Uh, the other thing is I don't think we think big enough. Uh, and so, you know, I've been involved in some fantastic projects with G First and, and in my role as, uh, uh, as Chief Exec of Viserian, you know, setting up the new U University Technical College in Berkeley. Brilliant. What we need is one of those bridges that Catherine's got on her thing to get our students the best opportunities that they can have to fill the skills gap that the businesses need to fill. And so for me, it's all about, as you said, connectivity, sorting out some of our issues getting the right people in the right places and then offering our support to actually drive that on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Neil is a great uh, standard bearer for business in Gloucestershire. Um, our next member of the panel is Andrew Callard. Andrew is Managing Director of Rural Technologies. Uh, he's also chair of an FEP subgroup on transport. Um, and he's something of an expert, I think, on the whole transport issue, which has come up this morning. It's a major issue in the forest. Andrew. Thank you, Neil. Um, transport's a major issue for all rural areas. Uh, and one of the key things of the Western Gateway is it combines the major cities with a lot of rural areas. Um, connectivity to and from those areas is very important. Um, and it's an area that at Rural Techs uh, we're leading in the UK. Uh, we've just completed a feasibility uh, study on behalf of the Geospatial Commission, uh, and we're bidding for a second round. So again, the Forest of Dean can continue to lead by building a demonstrator approach to uh, rural transport. So what are the issues with rural transport? Major issues, we're over-reliant on a car. You know, uh, here in the Forest of Dean, only 3% don't have access to a car. Nationally, it's 10%. Um, we have considered the economy based upon the car, and yet we look at Industry 4.0. You look at Industry 4.0 where people are working from home. Generally, in the rural economy, there's 30% of people work already from home. Um, so if we go to what other people have talked about, about the voice being heard, the voice being heard is actually a lot of people don't understand what is going on in the rural economy. They don't understand, for example, that the Forest of Dean has 10 key industry sectors. It is not just tourism. It is not just agriculture and food. That only employs 14% of our workforce. Manufacturing uh, employs over 16%. There is innovation already within the forest. So I welcome the Western Gateway. I think the Western Gateway is a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity for the journey that the Forest of Dean has already been on uh, over the last three to five years, where it's making its voice heard and also listening, listening to see how it can help solve the bigger problems. Uh, and that's why I look forward to uh, 
what what the Western Gateway will do with the forest, for the forest, and hopefully a little to the forest. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, our next panelist is Mark Owen, an old mate of mine. He's owner and editor of Punchline. And in these days of uh, changing media, Mark has really uh, done a brilliant job in developing Punchline. So it's a proper news website. And he also has a family interest in the forest. So Mark. Well, thanks ever so much for inviting me on this panel today. I feel really blessed actually. One of the things that uh, Punchline has been doing over the last 10 years is growing its readership. And the, and the secret to its success is old fashioned marketing. We actually deliver the magazine right around the, count, the county uh, with a pack on my back, go into every single high street, go into every business park, go into as far afield as possible. And just before the lockdown, we were actually 15,000 magazines and we hit around 150,000 readers. What actually happened over the pandemic is we had to get rid of the magazine and now we're down, we're up to around 250,000 unique visitors every month. One of the things I'd just like to say, I agree with everything that the panel said about the forest. I absolutely love the forest of Dean. I go there all the time. Um, it's a beautiful place, but not just that. What's really, really important about it are these hidden gems of businesses in these business parks. People sometimes think of Vantage Park, you know, Vantage Park, the business park. They think about maybe about the, the Lydney Harbour business park or even the Sydney, uh, the, the Cinderford one. But actually, there's lots and lots of individual business parks spread all over the, the, uh, the forest. And I think that's really the beauty of the forest, Dean, and, and part of its problem in some ways. It is so hard to get to from one place to the other. Uh, you talked about transport. I couldn't agree more with Andrew and, and, and same with Neil and same with, with Tim. But one of the things, and this is just a prime example, when I go out to these business parks and train states, it's really nice to get my, I get my magazine, and it's amazing what you can do. You can knock on the door, walk in and introduce yourself and actually talk to them. And I, I discovered this business in this tiny little business park. There's only six different companies there. And they make, uh, there's a chap sitting there and he was making, he was, he was operating a fan. He had some CAD drawings out. And uh, I said, how many guys work here? He said, oh, it's only me and two others. I said, what do, what do you do? And he makes fans. And they look, you know, these big sort of round fans. But they're not just any ordinary fans, they're actually part of an air conditioning unit that he's sold to British embassies around the world. 15 British embassies, actually. High tech, really unique. Um, and, and it's just one of these little companies that you don't think very much of, like a shed on the side of the road. And that is the beauty of the Forest of Dean. There are so many of these little companies beavering away, creating stuff, exporting around the world uh, and I think that's what we really got to champion these companies that could actually be a lot bigger with a lot more help and um, that's really what I would like to get across really I'm very proud of the fact that my wife's family comes from there um, and and so many great businesses out there and that's really why I wanted to get involved today uh, and and champion those companies that we can thanks very much Mark um, I'd like to come back to Catherine now and um, ask Catherine how we get Catherine how are we going to achieve uh, a better uh, position for the forest in terms of this region I think one of the issues that's come up today and I've edited newspapers in this area and uh, Bristol for about 15 16 years we don't shout about ourselves enough and, you know, I get fed up with hearing about the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands engine. So you've got a lot on your plate. How can you actually advance the, 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 the name and put a spotlight in the re on the region so we become like those powerhouses? Yeah, I mean, your, your question is, is well addressed there, actually, Ian, because... I didn't necessarily want it to be all about the name Western Gateway because there's such strong brands already in the area. I, uh, I, I try and call it area, by the way, rather than region, because whenever I deal with anyone from Wales, they say we're not a region. So we're an area. But you're right. Internationally and in, do in order for us to punch our weight 
uh, with those to, you know, we want them to listen to us on bids, etc. Then the Western Gateway name needs to get out there a bit more. It's, it's frustrated me, to be honest, that we haven't been able to do more. But I do actually feel that you need to have something to say that you stand for. And actually, it's because some of those stories, like Mark just said about the, the company building fans, is the kind of, for me, when you have a, a sort of case study and those nuggets of personal information about a success story that really brings things to life. Um, obviously, as you know, I work for Airbus, so I can talk about aerospace in the area but for a long time. I will be moving to this new uh, role, which will involve me more work in innovation and manufacturing. And these are all the things that our area are really fantastic at. Um, I was fascinated to hear what Andrew said about the number of people who work from home. I mean, this is, again, is another area that we can say, look, we actually do know how to work well and how to work it using virtual means and that there's more opportunities. I'm happy to take on the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands engine, but I can't do it alone. I'm happy to shout about our area. I'll go on that bridge behind me and wave a flag if necessary. I'll do whatever is needed. I'm a bit of a show off. I'm happy to be used in that way. And I know my deputy chairs on the board and the other board members are also happy to do that. I'm delighted um, that uh, Neil has agreed to become an ambassador. That was a quick, quick, quick deal. Thank you, Neil. We'll talk about that later. But I absolutely want business leaders such as him to get out there and talk because I have this strong view, and I've said this before, that business really listens to other business about why, where is a good place to invest. Obviously, um, political leaders are, have a role to play there too. But I think it's when businesses say, come here, the skills are great, the, the opportunities are great, and we can do more together. And that's, that's my key focus, Ian. Neil, on that point, what, what more do we need to do to make the forest really have some sort of position and economically? So I think, um, you know, I've written down some, some points here, you know, it all starts from good education and we're very fortunate. I had a, got into a bit of a spat on social media with someone the other day, you know, what has anybody ever done for Cinderford or the Forest of Dean? And I was sat there listing off the projects and the amount of money that's, that's come in from central government through G first LEP to the Forest of Dean. And, and so if we can, if we can sort the education, it's then about job creation. It's about, using these, uh, you know, getting all of these things that we've spoken about to actually come together. Because once you start getting people employed, whether they're at home or they're in factories or they're in, uh, you know, working for government or whatever, that's when the local economy really starts to thrive, when people can start to spend money. But of course, we need to also solve the housing issue. And the housing issue is highly emotive. Everybody knows the need for houses. No, them, no one wants them in their back garden, though. And so, you know, along with transportation, housing is a big issue. And we've got a beautiful place that we live in. No one wants to spoil it. But by the same token, we need those young people to come into the Forest of Dean to rejuvenate the area and to, to start that whole cycle of, um, uh, you know, that, that leads to, to employment and uh, these really, you know, great people to start businesses, to run businesses from home. So all of those things need to come together. Now, when we start thinking, you know, I get really annoyed when, you know, Lindy wants to do its own thing or Coldford or Cinderford, because actually this is a much bigger problem as I've spoken about before. You know, I, I can only, you know, I started my, my business in a garage 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked with Andrew and I, I see Nigel Salters on here as well. And, you know, we've been able to employ people and, and to give people opportunities, but it's been bloody hard. And uh, we need people, we need to make that transition much easier for people. The old days when people worked for very big organizations are long gone. You know, there's something like 30, 36,000 businesses in Gloucestershire, I think, at the last count. You know, a lot of those are small to micro businesses, which is great. And, and, and to be honest, when people are working from home, we, that has an impact on the transportation issue. But we need to make that transition easier. And all too often, we were faced with a dilemma that, you can move your business to Wales and you can get a grant in Wales or you can be in Gloucestershire, but because Gloucestershire is, is deemed to be a quite affluent area, even though the Forest of Dean might not be the most affluent in that area, 
you have to make those choices and I don't want to make those choices. And I think if we start, you know, this is a real good opportunity to start thinking about cross border, uh, you know, uh, ideas, you know, getting you know, the educational facilities to work. I sit as a honorary fellow at the University of Gloucestershire and sometimes they're competing with Swansea and they're competing with Cardiff or they're competing with UWE and we don't need that competition. What we need is their own specialisms and for them to excel in their areas that uh, that are important. But th those are my views anyway, Ian. Th thanks, Neil. Tim, um, the let, we're, one of our key things in the local industrial strategy was how are we going to keep young people in Gloucestershire? And that must be a real big issue for the forest, isn't it? We knew a few years ago we had those horrendous crashes didn't we in a year I think you know over 20 young people were killed tearing around the streets of the forest you can make all sorts of excuses here but the fact is you know we've got to have better employment for young people so how are we going to encourage our young people to stay in the forest get jobs in the forest you're absolutely right, Ian. Um, I think it was probably, I think it was three weeks after I took over as leader of the council, the government came out with its list of social mobility in different districts. And I think we were 304th out of 315. It was a complete and utter shame to me and any councillor that went before me. Um, and we've tried to change that and we're trying to change it now. Uh, how we can do it, um, the, again, I'm going to mention the Levelling Up Fund, which is hugely important to us at the moment. It's enabled us at the moment to um, partner up with Harper University. Um, we're going to do some really good work with them. Um, it will also enable us to offer business opportunity for young people, young entrepreneurs in, in Sydneyford and in Coford, similarly at Harper University. It will enable a real opportunity for those young people to stay in the forest. Now, here's where I'm going to be a little critical, and, and apologies for those that were involved in the Gloucestershire 2050 vision, which I'm sure was a wonderful piece of work that came up with that the Forest of Dean should be a regional park. A regional park is what they said that the Forest of Dean should be. Um, I think many of us saw that and thought, hang on, we can change that. And I'm glad to say now it is changing from it. The Forest of Dean has great ambitions. And I know, as I said, I know Cyber Central is really key to Gloucestershire, and I know it's, it's, it's massive. But frankly, I don't want to lose our bright young entrepreneurs to Cyber Central. I want them to stay in the forest. I want them to live in the forest. I want them to spend their, their wages in the forest. I don't want everything to be made. Cyber Central, the M4 and M5 corridor, and that's the way that we've been put for the last three or four years. And I'm afraid it now has to stop. We have an opportunity to stop through the Western Gateway and also through the Leveling Up Fund. And I think it's, we have to give, and this is the word that keeps coming out, opportunity to young people. Our people, young people are just as bright, just as clever, just as forward thinking. You've got one now, you've got Neil Ricketts, who's a case in point. You know, look, look at what Neil's done. And I think I probably would have said something different before the pandemic, but I don't think it's going to be big companies to get this country through the pandemic. It's not your massive companies, because they'll survive anyway. And what I've been encouraged by are the sort of businesses that Mark was referring to earlier. They're still there fighting away. They're still battling away. They're growing. And it's going to be those companies that get this country, this region, this area, out of the pandemic and going forward. Like, and again, that's all about timing. What they say about timing being an opportunity being all about timing, it's all coming together at the right time. If we get our heads together and get this right, it could be not only get past the pandemic, it could be boom time for the forest, and I'll call it the area for, for Catherine's sake. I, I genuinely believe it. We, we want to keep our young people here. We want to encourage them to start up businesses, and that's what we're going to be doing here. Right, that's, that's great, Tim. Tim, can I ask you, um, is it true you felt uh, over the last 10, 15 years, a bit of a drift in the forest, a bit of an island. I'm not saying that, you know, you've been, you've been quite critical yourself of uh, the county council here. Just seems to me recently you're for, forging great partnerships with South Wales. 
If I'd say, I mean, I took, I said, I took over as leader in 2017. Um, within three months, we invited the leader of Monmouthshire Council to, to meet us. That was the first time any member of Monmouthshire Council had come to the Forest Green Council. And I think that tells you, inward looking, we, and I think Gloucestershire, had been up to that point. And I think it's, 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 it's an unfortunate thing to have to say, but I think Gloucestershire has been too politically led. It's been inward looking. It's wanted to look after Gloucestershire. We even, and I'm going to mention it now because it's something I'll bring up with, with, with Gloucestershire at some point. You know, we even have an issue now where there's an overriding committee for planning, Gloucestershire planning. There's one for economic growth, which is great. There's even one for tourism. Now, our tourism, our tourism um, uh, um, delivery uh, company is the Dean and White Dean Tourism. They're doing a fabulous job, have done for the last 15 years. The overriding Gloucestershire County Council version of it won't even mention the fact that we're cross-border. They can't mention it. They can't bring themselves to say that actually the Y Valley is also good. To, and it, it just filters down, it just waters things down. So, whereas I understand that there's been issues, I mean, look, look, look down at Sedbury, look, look down at, you know, on the Chepstow border that end. It's just been left to rot, is what I'm going to say. It's been left because it's, it's far enough away that you can forget about it. Not enough people down there to moan about it, not enough people down there to shout about it. Those days are now ending, thank God. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I've reached out now and, and we've reached out as a council, I don't care who they are, we will sit down, we will break bread with them, and we will make sure that we deliver what's right for this this, this district here. Uh, yeah, Tim, following this meeting, what, uh, what are you going to prioritise in terms of issues for Catherine? I, you know, I've said this to Catherine before, and I've said, it, it, for me, it's, it's, not, it's not the big things. To, and what I don't want the Western Gateway to become is that regional development agency that failed in the 80s, because that, that's the way. It's, and, and this is nothing I haven't said to Catherine before. I think it should be district-led. I generally think that's the difference between us and an order and powerhouse. They've already got their areas of strong power bases that have come together. Gloucestershire was never that united. It was always looking in. You know, it, it never did do deals with Bristol. It never did do deals with South Wales. And that's why I think the districts can be so powerful and so passionate. It's the districts and those, those grassroots organisations, the grassroots local authorities that will really have the passion and drive for this thing. And what we actually need is we need the experience of the, uh, of the LEP and the county to assist us in doing it. And that, that's where I'd like to go. I just think if we try to copy what the Northern Paris would do, we end up being a diluted version of it. Let's do it differently. Let's do it grassroots up. And I think we will be highly successful. Andrew, uh, what do you think of that situation on partnership? How important is the partnership with South Wales for the forest, for instance? Fundamental. Uh, when I was uh, chair of the FEPS Bridges and Borders subgroup, uh, which is now merged with Transport Infrastructure, we reached out and uh, had representatives from Monmouthshire. Uh, we were invited, or FEP is invited, to sit on Monmouthshire's strategic transport group. Uh, we also had uh, representatives from Stroud, uh, and what was interesting was the commonality, the commonality of issues of connectedness, uh, commonality of issues around balance. Uh, so the, the forest is forward thinking in terms of its balance, it wants to protect its environment, the uniqueness of what is here, uh, as what Marcus said earlier, it sort of hides some of our effectiveness, but actually it isn't, I think it's a, a model for the future. So I think the aspirations about a biosphere reserve work extremely well with that because it enables that protection, but is also not just an environmental model, it's an economic model. It's also the balance between young and old. We've got to enable the young to remain. We've got to enable the young to be connected. We look at connectivity, I'm thinking here, both of digitally and in real life transport. They can't move. 
if you look at the decline of young people getting driving licenses or in rural economies being prevented from driving simply by the costs uh, you restrict their opportunities we can provide those opportunities but also we have typically in rural areas aging populations they have other needs that we need to serve and again by reaching out and working as a whole and and, and tim's view of district bottom up uh, works particularly well for that um, we also have something quite interesting in the forest um, with the tolls coming off we had an outflux of, of people from bristol uh, acquiring uh, properties in uh, south of the forest and also in southern wales um, which is quite interesting when you look at what the response to COVID has been. People are buying houses and properties an hour further away on the commute. Why? Because they expect a more flexible, balanced lifestyle. Um, and we've got an area that actually is a test area, a test area that actually can see what are their connectivity needs and how they're best met in a time of a carbon emergency the climate emergency. So again, learning from the forest. The forest has taken a very big uh, challenge, how to make the district, not just the council, but the district carbon neutral by 2030. Um, transport lies at the key of that. Transport's done nothing since, 20, since 1990. It outputs the same amount of CO2. Um, therefore, uh, you know, we've got to address that. Therefore, we've got to listen uh, and share exemplars across our uh, fellow districts, because actually it's the changes about individuals, not about big policymakers, not about big business. It's individuals who are going to drive us forward and drive the Western Gateway forward. Andrew, you're at the centre of this uh, really quite revolutionary project on transport. Can you briefly tell people what that is? Yes, so um, there's a big theory uh, which is called mobility as a service um, and uh, it exists uh, all over the place. So you, you would look at something like Transport for London. It has what is called a level one integrated system of mobility as a service. Big difficulty of it is that it, all the approaches come from urban. All the scenarios are urban because for people like Uber, there's actually enough people there. Our project actually looked at it from the rural end uh, and it worked with the Countryside and Community Research Institute at the University of Gloucestershire, who produced a report and assessment on rural transport systems uh, across the, the world. That report has actually gone to an OECD subgroup to look at it, it's so important. We also worked with Warwick Manufacturing Group, uh, which is part of the University of Warwick, uh, which uh, looked at cyber security uh, from their, their team, which looks at connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that's developed a completely new secure software development lifecycle model. So maybe the answer to Tim about cyber security is important, but you don't have to be based in Gloucester to do it. You can do it here. It also worked with uh, three uh, IT developers based in Gloucestershire. One, to develop a traveler app so that we could create a smart ticket that combines scheduled and unscheduled services. For there to be a fully flexible network of transport in the countryside, you have to take it wider than just buses. You have to include community transport. You have to include taxis. You will ultimately include car share because what people in the countryside need from our studies of inhabitants is certainty. And what they also need is flexibility. The old economic givens of you travel from A to B every day, you travel to work every day, you come back, is no longer true. Yeah, if we look at our inhabitants, we have people I mentioned working from home, but the current models don't account for the person who one day a week works in Lancaster or the person who works in London. Um, we've got to address that. We've got to address that. Uh, through smart ticketing, but also by engaging the operators and providing data. Data, I think, uh, as Catherine said, is key uh, to our decision making. Um, the data on rural travel is appallingly bad. The data will also inform the future. So 
what we're doing is creating this, uh, or hopefully creating, because we've got a bid in at the moment, or putting a bid in, uh, which will allow us to build the prototype and demonstrate it, guess where, in the Forest of Dean, uh, and have an answer by uh, March 2022. Um, it has also come about in the uh, first uh, flows of the project by talking with the Forest of Dean District Council about their needs and how it actually feeds into things like the local plan. Um, because we're making a presumption and the world is making a presumption that the answer is electric, electric vehicles. And I'll just finish on this, this scaremongering dangerous bit. So electric vehicles. So if you go with the 2019 report by the West, the uh, Western Power, another Western, uh, it will is the equivalent of one small household's worth of electricity to charge an EV. Most people in the countryside have two cars. National Grid says that power through charging EV will add an 8% to the peak usage. Telegraph used the same figures and said we needed 20 more power stations. Yet it was only in November 2019 that they miscalculated the National Grid and we had blackouts in various places. We've also got to consider that the carbon emergency also takes away gas and oil boilers in new bills from 2025 you start adding lots and lots of electricity just to keep us in the lifestyle to which we're currently accustomed. That's why transport is so important. That's why connectivity is so important. So that we can actually have a choice as to whether or not we will move around or stay where we are and power the innovation that we have already in the forest. Great stuff, Andrew. Absolutely brilliant work on that. Interesting today, I hear that this morning Ofgem have just announced a huge um, up, upsurge in uh, mm -hmm. car charging points throughout the uh, UK. Mark, what, what's your thought on this? Because transport and everything about transport does permeate uh, forest living. You're on mute, Mark. Mark, you're on mute. Ha, there's always one, isn't there? Sorry. And what I said made common sense, made great sense then. Anyway, um, no, what I was saying, what I was saying again. certainly, um, very interesting what Andrew's saying. And one of the, I've been worried about this quite some time, actually. We're all going to go to electric cars. How the hell are we all going to power all this sort of stuff as they close the gas and oil? Um, refineries would have, you know, um, uh, are getting rid of gas boilers. It's, just, it's gonna be so much power. And you, 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 you're really right. I mean, um, part of living in a rural environment like the Forest of Dean and driving around everywhere, it's, it's really difficult to get from A to B sometimes, let alone if you're gonna see, um, you know, different clients. Part of the reason why lots of businesses don't go over to the forest is so time consuming. Now, things like this, Zoom, or teams have been fantastic at connecting us all together. And I can see in the future, perhaps maybe this is the way to do business. Lots of people have already asked me, you know, can we can we meet again? Can we uh, have, have an actual appointment and meet face to face? But if you get the opportunity, I don't see why. I, I'll be honest with you. I much prefer to have a meeting like this. It saves on the carbon footprint. It saves on energy, it saves on time. And I think Andrew is dead right moving forward is that somewhere it has to be this this balance of what the future is going to look like or what it could become um, with, with the cars and, and, and buses all zip zapping all over the place is just not going to work. Um, so it all goes back to, as you, as you, as you rightly said, um, that, um, that, the, that the, oh, it's, it's just a confusing place to be. That's the problem, really, to connect it all. And there are so many great businesses out there that need need the energy, need the help that, that so hopefully that can be done here. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> Catherine, can I ask you um, what success would look like for you, having heard, this puts you on the spot a bit, but what does success look like for the forest with the Western Gateway? You've heard a lot this morning. What would you take away? Well, I, I really like the um, 
the narrative um, that's come out about being the central, the central, the center of the gateway. It's, it's, it's true, factually, geographically, and um, it's something that really is really making me think about. And, and Tim did this to me actually when we first chatted. Tim, you know, you really talked to me about the economy of the Forest of Dean and, and brought it home, and we had a chat because I actually live in North Wiltshire in quite a rural area too, and. It is quite a struggle sometimes when you think about a whole area with the huge urban conurbations and then the, the towns and then the rural areas. I mean, listening to Andrew talking about rural transport, I think a bus comes through my village twice a day. Um, you can't possibly go anywhere on the bus if you, you need regular timetables. Um, so I absolutely can see the benefits of, of, of having the Forest of Dean as being right at the heart of the gateway. I'm delighted to hear the outreach you've done to Monmouthshire. Um, I've had some discussion with Monmouthshire council representatives and I, I need to do more. Um, I was waiting a little for the um, Senate elections in Wales um, and I will, one suggestion made to me um, is that I go and do a briefing and have a chat with some of the new Senate members. So I, you know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? That just because it happens to be a border on a map that you shouldn't work together um, and, you know, you know we need to be we need to work together in partnerships of course there's going to be individual pockets of pride about a certain area and uh, Neil talked a bit about sports and competition that's that's always healthy um I mean by the way I don't think the northern powerhouse and the Midlands engine is all rosy by the way um I I do remember when the northern powerhouse was first launched and I'm like why why don't we have one for our area um, they're a very different setup and they're really huge in terms of footprint, uh, in terms of population, economy. We are different. We are bottom up. So I'm delighted to hear what you're saying about it should come from, from the heart, from the depth. Um, it, we are bottom up because that's how we got going from this very first report that I showed in, in, in my presentation. Um, but we just need to keep momentum. I'm sure some of you have seen things like this come and go. Um, uh, you know, I'm putting my time into it. Lots of other people are putting our time into it. And the challenge we have on this whole levelling up is it's seen about north and south. And I'm absolutely happy to go into bat um, to say we've got to look at all the, econ the economic footprint, the issues, the stats. And it isn't just about north and south. Maybe levelling up isn't the greatest of words, but we've got to work with it. One, one expression I heard from a senior civil servant was that it's a lens to look at policy through. So that's where you have to make the case. So in the answer to your, real answer to your question, Ian, success for me is getting a strong voice on regional bids. If there's something the Forest of Dean is fighting for that they feel that you'd like Western Pow Powerhouse to support, I'm happy to do that. I work for a wing design and manufacturing company. So I talk about the wind beneath the wings. Let's use that. And the other thing is to work with other businesses, whether large or small, on encouraging other businesses to come and invest. And just one final comment, Ian. Um, the other day, I mean, it's sometimes unexpected to know what sort of things you're asked to do when you're asked to chair something like this. But the other day I was asked to do a very confidential call with a major inward investor who was looking at a site um, more south of our area. I didn't know the name of the company, but they were asking me a lot of questions and, you know, the government have asked me to do that kind of thing. And, and it's not just me, it'll be other business ambassadors too. So if businesses get behind this and fight for an inward investor, then I think that as a partnership, and I completely agree with all the comments that have been made, as a partnership, you can do better. Just, just need uh, you to persuade Elon Musk to come to the forest now. Tim, on the same point, what do you want Catherine to take away today in terms of things that you want to be actioned for the forest? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the projects, Catherine's well for us, and, and, and the need that we have to open up our district to other areas. And, and from a connectivity point of view, as Andrew's all currently. What I would say is this, she said earlier, and she was quite right, that we need to, be, we need to stand out from those other powerhouses. And I'm, I'm glad she's taken on board, it should be um, 
almost you know grassroots up and, and that's really important and i think it's, it's massive we can be different by that center and that epicenter of this this powerhouse being not in a city not in a region but in a little old place like the forest of dean because it doesn't matter where you put the center of it where you put your offices or where you put your offices but if it's in bristol people from wiltshire will see it as a bristol issue if you put it in gloucester they will see it as a gloucester project put it in the forest of dean i'll give you two offices now in the district council offices that you can use it'll have a printer all the connectivity you want and it can be the great western powerhouse office and i think that can then be and what it could be and you'll have to forgive me for the political you know it could be the people's powerhouse and that's what our area should be forget about big big business up north and the central and all that let's be the people's powerhouse because all of us in this area this region have at some point suffered the same sort of issues that we're all suffering now 30 years ago it was newport they were having to give you know all sorts of um incentives for companies to come there it's us there it might be gloucester it could be wiltshire next time it could be the people's powerhouse if we center it in the forest of dean so it's not attached to any one of the big cities thanks tim neil um what do you want catherine to take away in terms of business and the economy i, I think uh i think what i'd say is you know you only have to go back into history to see how great the Forest of Dean was and could be in the future. So if you look at uh, steel manufacture through the Mushet Brothers, that happened in Colford. We wouldn't have steel, you wouldn't have Airbus, I'm afraid, Catherine, without uh, the Foresters. And it's forgotten. And, um, you know, when I started Viserian, I started it with the pure aim of creating opportunity for the local area. And I, I'm still passionate about that. And so what we're doing now with graphene is no different to what Mushet did with steel. And, um, you know, that's just that's just my personal journey. There's lots of other people that are also on other journeys. You know, it doesn't matter whether you look at um, stocks, road sweepers or, you know, any of the other great businesses that we have in the Forest of Dean. It can punch its weight, but it just doesn't talk about it. It doesn't celebrate its successes. So. Don't forget about us is i guess what i'm saying to you catherine and if you make me an ambassador you're going to be sick to death of me but you know i think for me i want this i want the western gateway to be different to the northern powerhouse and to the midlands i think as we move forward environmental aspects home working uh, the way that society functions will be massive changes and the forest of dean is well set up to be uh, an exemplar uh, area you know it can challenge uh, and, uh, you know, there's no reason why you can't look out of your window and see a beautiful forest, but also have 900 megabit broadband and be talking to the guys in South Korea or, or in America or wherever you want to talk to. So for me, if you want to try something, try it here. The people are very, very good at adapting to change uh, and very good about taking on challenges. Uh, we're, 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 you know, we're very hardy. And, um, you know, COVID has been really tough for a lot of businesses, but I'm pleased to say that we're seeing a bounce back and that people have got the bit between their teeth. I see Kevin's on the line from uh, Vantage Point. We've got a fantastic opportunity with our growth hub there to be able to get behind these businesses. And, uh, you know, that's what I would be saying to Tim or yourself is let's start promoting these businesses. Let's make them successful. Let's show what can be done and let's resolve some of the issues that are cross border. And let's make uh, you know, the Western Gateway the best powerhouse in the country. Um, you know, it's got a unique proposition in being cross border and it can show the other powerhouses how it can be done. Thanks, Neil. Andrew, best powerhouse in the country. Is that the aim? Absolutely. It's a very short answer, but absolutely, because I think one of the key things that, that Catherine said earlier, uh, our Welsh uh, colleagues object to the idea of a, a region. It's about an area and the area could be a district because it's actually we're creating something that is unique, which is, as Neil goes, bottom up. Um, if you talk about an area, you can talk about my area. My area as a business person is the Forest of Dean, is Gloucestershire, and is the footprint of the Western Gateway. 
I see opportunities in all of those. I see the benefits of collaboration. So I'll go back uh, to the project that I was allowed to allude to. That project has discussions with Weka in its future transport hub. We're also having discussions with the Transport for Wales. Why? Because they're interested in the innovation that is coming from this district that came from the bottom up, that came for what are the real rural challenges of connectivity, both digitally and also in real life. So if we can answer some of those and we can use the forest as an exemplar area that then cascades across the Western Gateway, that then cascades across the whole of the UK by saying, look what the Western Gateway is doing. Look what the districts are doing within the Western Gateway and the way that they are collaborating so everybody gains. Thanks so much, Andrew. Mark, what have you um, heard this morning that makes you excited about the future uh, with Western Gateway? Well, I think the fact that we're all around the table and we're all, we're all working together, the fact that, that um, there's so many excellent businesses out here in the Forest of Dean, out, out there in the Forest of Dean. And it really is right, as someone said earlier, it's about championing those and pushing those forward. And if we can connect together and, and do as Andrew said and push it up from the bottom upwards, I think it just could be a great success. You know, what, what Neil did with Vasarian, there are lots of, no offense, Neil, but there are lots of Neils hidden away in the forest. We've just got to bring them out and, and help them along the way. The most difficult thing for a small business to do is grow. It's from that very, those small acorns, that one to two to three. And I think, I think if somehow with the education, with grants, with help from government, I think the LEP, by the way, and the hubs have done a fantastic job. And I think there the is just amazing opportunity. And I think it's all down to us, perhaps, to, to all of us to be ambassadors, to actually um, uh, fly the flag for the forest, fly the flag for Gloucestershire, but actually fly the flag for the whole, the whole idea of this. I think we could, all, we could all benefit from it. Thanks, Mark. I know Sam's on the call. Sam's an old mate, newspaper days, who uh, is FSB uh, man in the area. Sam, what are your thoughts on today and the Western Gateway going forward for the forest? Hi, Ian. I don't know if you could, can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited by this morning. I think there's been some um, um, fantastic conversations and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a convert to the forest. My in-laws live there. I've really got to, to love the place. And I think it's, there's a lot of untapped potential there. And I think the danger for somewhere like the forest is when you're in such a big area as, 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 as this is going to be, the Western Gateway is going to be, is getting a bit lost. So I really like Tim's ambition to why not make it the center? Why does it have to be one of the bigger areas that has that role? So um, with so many great small businesses and larger businesses and, and a brilliant network between both Wales and England, the forest would be a fantastic place to be. So uh, yeah, we're very excited about what's gonna happen with uh, the Western Gateway, but we want small businesses to be at the heart of it and we want the forest to be at the heart of it. So maybe this conversation will move in that direction. So uh, thank you everyone. It's been a really, really useful morning. Thanks, Sam. I've got a question here from David Trevelli. David uh, is a great ambassador for the forest, big tech man, uh, one of uh, Andrew's partners who says <clears throat> COVID and changes in people's lifestyle has indicated that cities, <clears throat> excuse me, may now not grow to the circa 70% of global population by 2050. How could this potential trend influence the Western Gateway strategy? How could this be used to the benefit of the Forest of Dean? Any, any thoughts on that, Catherine? Well, I think it de definitely, it, I think, I don't know how you all feel, but I think the UK has got to get its house in order in terms of how it presents itself internationally. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of PR around it. Um, and there's lots of good endeavours, but it's been a bit unsettled, hasn't it, the last few years. So for me, if local areas can get their act together quicker than maybe some of the central organisations, no harm in that. Businesses are continuing to look for places to, to locate. They, they are often looking for stories about skills and whether the local FE colleges are providing the right um, the right 
courses um, tailored to their business needs, what, what the workforce uh, approach is like. And I think a, a speaker earlier was talking about the capabilities or, uh, and the flexibility of the people from, from the forest. And I hope that's true for the, West, the rest of the Western Gateway. So one of the ambitions I've got is to really get our narrative right about what is what our strengths are. And then that can help us have input to, um, if we need to, to the centre in terms of the DIT offering. But for me, one of the things I perhaps should touch on if I, while I've got the floor, Ian, is the first um, economic report, which I mentioned we've had commissioned. And some of the interesting things that came out there is, and it's kind of blindingly obvious, but is to build on our existing strengths. So looking at the sectors where we're already strong, um, that's whether it's cyber, semiconductors, the digital work, some of the innovative ideas on transport, um, some of you know companies such as Niels, um, and obviously some of the smaller companies that Mark was referring to. Build on those strengths, look at where we're really good and where we are different from the rest of the UK. There are some issues, I'll be honest, in, that came up in our economic report about productivity. Uh, we, we have some, a shortfall in terms of our statistics there, and we're trying to work out what the reason of that is. Um, and, and one answer will be to get the digital connectivity better so that we can be fleet of foot. The other output was what I just said earlier, Ian, about getting our house in order about our inward investment offer. So we are able to champion, be very clear and measurable. I often say when I talk at things like this, that the average man or woman in the street down from in the road where I live, if you said to them, what, the, what is the Western Gateway, they wouldn't have a clue. Um, so that, that's fine. But um, for me, I want us to have a very good, strong voice externally outside in, in the rest of the world to get people to think about us. We have, I love the fact that we're a popular area for tourism. If people know about us for that reason, that's good, but build on it. Um, so I think there are many, many opportunities. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Tim, before you give us uh, your poem, I'm, have you written a few words for us? I've got a few words for you, Ian. Yes, yeah. All yeah. right. Before you do that, can I give you, you're the leader of the forest, uh, the last word here. I found this really quite inspirational. Um, uh, over the years of editing newspapers in this region, you know, I've always tried to support the forest uh, as Mark has and I know Sam has with the FSB. I think we are getting some traction now. We're getting noticed. We really are. I'd, I'd almost say we're on a bit of a roll, but you've got to keep rolling. So what have you got out of this morning and what Catherine has said? Um, what I've got out of it is that there is hope. There's hope and an opportunity. I mean, Catherine referred to productivity being dead. I think we've lost a generation who lost hope. There's a generation there who, who kind of gave up, didn't think that anybody would be looking at this area, didn't think that anybody would be looking at the areas that this, this powerhouse is going to cover. And, you know, we, we, we've, got, we've got parents that pass that almost mistrust of authority on to young people. And what I see this morning with the people that are interested in this and the people that are driving this is that can be changed. Young people and, and business people can be given hope. They can be given opportunity. They can see light at the end of the tunnel. They can see there's help for them. And they can, they can see that somebody actually wants them to achieve. And honestly, you know, people in the forest, people in Gloucestershire, people in the southwest, South Wales, that's all they need. That's all they need is that, that level of opportunity and the, and, the, and the thought that somebody's behind them. Somebody's going to give them the backing. Do with them, not unto them and they will succeed. Is that the poem? No, that's not, that's not, did it sound like a poem? <laughs> well, why don't you give us a few words? Of I'll give you a few words, okay. Apologies to this anyway, I just scribbled this down. Okay, um, with Catherine and with Andrew, with Mark and with Ricketts, on Ian's web thing, they were just the ticket. The Great Western Gateway was the tale of which we talked, and I'm telling you now, they talked a walk, they can walk. A chance for the forest to make a large shout and help in a region and a whole country out. Yes, we need to be central, the bullseye of the board. If we get this thing done, instead of Mr. Ricketts, it might be Lord. Very good. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
That's that's absolutely brilliant. You haven't got a poem to end. You haven't got any poetry, Catherine, to end. Well, I, I, I haven't written anything, but just listening to you reminded me, I, one of the other things I do apart from chairing this and doing my work is I'm, I'm really into music and I I'm, sing a lot in choirs and I play the organ and the piano. And I was having a singing lesson yesterday and I was studying a piece which was set to lyrics by Shakespeare. And one of the lines from the poem was, the reed is at, as the oak, which I thought was very good when I'm talking to people about the Forest of Dean. And why that the line talked about that, the, the fact that a reed is flexible, but an, an oak is a very strong and sturdy part of our natural environment. And one of the things I've really heard about today, Ian, is how flexible people in the Forest of Dean want to be. I know there are independents as well, but I think the flexibility is absolutely key. So it's interesting that this poem was talking about the reed and the oak together, and I think that's a great combination. Absolutely fantastic. And Tim, you know, I, I didn't know uh, you were the bard of the forest, but this is something you've got to keep up. And I just want to thank all that panel. Catherine, uh, absolutely brilliant that you came today. Uh, I think the, is the issues I hope you're going to take away. Uh, Tim, brilliant. And uh, Neil, uh, great innovator, big colleague of mine at the uh, LEP. And Andrew, your work you're doing on uh, transport is fantastic. And Mark, um, the support you give to the forest is really, really brilliant. Uh, I just want to close now and thank everyone. There's been a lot of people on this call and I just think it reflects the great interest uh, of a great area. And I use that word area and that's something that I shall take away from this. And Catherine, you have really uh, helped a great deal, I think, in forming in a lot of people's minds what we need to do and what we need to aspire to do uh, to make this area part of your powerhouse. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ian. Bye. Thank you.